This is ChestertonRadio.com. This is the NBC Theater. From the NBC Theater in Hollywood, we bring you an hour-length drama adapted from Elizabeth Bowen's exciting novel, The House in Paris. And at intermission, it will be our special pleasure to present a commentary on this work by Elizabeth Bowen herself, a commentary which she recorded for the NBC Theater on her recent visit to this country. Here now, The House in Paris, as adapted for radio by Richard E. Davis of NBC. In a taxi, skidding away from the Gare du Nord, on a greasy February morning before the shutters were down, Naomi Fisher sat straight and thin in an olive green coat and skirt that looked black in the light of a Paris morning shed by a watery sky of wet light. Miss Fisher, Miss because her father had been English, was a French woman with all the animation gone. But this morning she was curiously emotional. The small, prim English girl who sat beside her in the plunging cab thought that Miss Fisher's manner had been very emotional from their first meeting in the railway station, when Miss Fisher had identified herself as the lady with whom Henrietta, for that was the English girl's name, would spend the day between trains. The boat train that had brought Henrietta from London and the train for the south that would carry Henrietta to her grandmother, who was wintering in Montone. Miss Fisher's black furs gave out a camphory smell that made Henrietta nervous, and she hugged even closer her toy plush monkey and fingered its stitched felt paws. You must be fond of your monkey, Henrietta. You play with him, I expect? Not nowadays much. I just always seem to take him about, you know. Oh, for company then, I, I suppose? Yes, I like to think he enjoys things. His name is Charles. Well, I hope he enjoys his day at our house. I'm sure he will. He has a very even disposition. Who lives in your house, Miss Fisher? My mother and myself. Just two people in the whole house? Oh, it is only a tiny house. Although, many years ago, there were many more people... Well-to-do English girls from the very best family stayed with my mother while they studied in Paris. Oh, but that is no more, since my mother is so very ill. I'm sorry to hear that. Has Madame Fisher been ill long? It has been ten years that my mother has been in bed. She is constantly ill, but wonderfully full of spirit. She is fond of visitors, Henrietta, and, and wants to see you and, and Leopold. My monkey's name is Charles. Oh, no, no. You see, Leopold is a little boy. A little boy where? Well, today he is at our house, as you are coming to our house while you wait for the train to Monton. So, Leopold came last night from Spezia on the Italian coast to meet someone at our house. Is Leopold Italian? I speak a little French, but I don't speak Italian at all. No, he is not Italian. Leopold's mother was English. His father, French-Jewish. Uh, I've been wanting somehow to ask you, Henrietta, to, to be a little considerate of Leopold when you meet him. You may find him agitated and, and shy, Has his but... journey upset him? Oh, no, no, no. It isn't that. You see, it is Leopold's mother he's going to meet, and... And he's never met her before, that is, since he can remember. That is rather unusual. Has he met his father at all? His father is dead, alas. Then with whom does he live in Spezia? Oh, a very kind American family who have adopted him. All these circumstances which seem so strange to you, Henriette, are, are also very sad. I've only told you this much in order that you may not ask more... Do you understand? In my own way, I think I do. Well, I beg of you, do not ask questions of Leopold. There's so much about him that he does not know. 
I never ask people questions, especially boys. Is he congenial? Oh, yes, yes. You would take him for perhaps French or, or Jewish. Well, it would have been better if he had been a girl as long as we have to spend the day together. Only this morning. His mother is coming this afternoon. But when you meet him, you will like him. When will that be? Well, you will meet him as soon as you've had a little breakfast and then a nap. Oh, I wouldn't want to go to bed and sleep away any of my first day in Paris. Well, I will arrange for you to rest yourself like a real French lady on the sofa in the salon. Oh! Whatever can that be? It's only old Madame Fisher upstairs pounding with her cane. Oh. Leopold! How did you know my name? Miss Fisher said we would meet after my nap. What are you doing in here? Nothing. Then why have you come? Because Miss Fisher told me not to. Oh, is this your monkey? Yes, his name is Charles. I've had him ever since I was born. Oh? Don't twist his ear like that, you'll hurt him. That's Miss Fisher's mother again. She's deathly ill. You don't think she'll die while we're here, do you? That would be terrible. Uh, I suppose it would. But I don't know Madame Fisher, so I don't care. We've never even met. And anyway, my mother is coming, so she and I will be out. What will you and your mother do? Oh, most likely have tea somewhere. What did Miss Fisher say to you about my mother and me, Henrietta? Oh, she just said that your mother lived somewhere else. Somewhere else? From where? From you. Oh, and I suppose you thought that was funny? Yes, I did. I did think it was funny, rather. And if you told it to other people, would they think it was funny? But I promised not to tell anybody. I don't see why. It's no secret about me. Oh? Miss Fisher let me feel there was. Did she ask you not to ask me things? She told me not to answer whatever you said. She hopes I won't say anything. Then ought you to? I don't have to be obedient to Miss Fisher. It's not my fault if you're here while I talk. I think I hear Miss Fisher coming. Then let her come. I'm not afraid of Miss Fisher. Oh, you two have made friends, I see. Yes, thank you. We've been chatting. Oh, that is very nice, your company for each other. That will help pass the day. I shan't be here long. My mother is coming for me. Of course, Leopold. Oh, oh, that is my mother, Henrietta. She, she cannot leave her bed. Uh, if you are rested now, we can go up and have our little visit. Doesn't she want to see Leopold, too? Oh, yes, yes, but, but later... For now, we will leave Leopold here to rest so he will be fresh when his mother comes. Of course. I'll stay right here and rest, Miss Fisher. That's a good boy. Come along, Henrietta. Very well. We won't be long, Leopold. Good riddance. Now, I'll just take a look and see what Miss Fisher left behind in her handbag. Sometimes people leave letters. Oh, of all the mirrors and silly junk. Oh, here we are. A letter in my mother's handwriting. Or the envelope, anyway. Oh, it's empty. They're always empty. Oh, but here's another envelope from Spezia. And it isn't empty. Oh, I bet they never meant for me to read this. It's from my Aunt Marion to Miss Fisher. Dear Miss Fisher, Leopold's train will leave Italy on Tuesday and arrive in Paris. It's... Uh, if you will be so kind as to meet him. The idea of Leopold's meeting with his mother fills us with dread. He is highly excitable, and mental tension always affects his stomach. We know of your tender feeling for Leopold, which your tie in the past with his unfortunate father will always renew. And to you, we can say that we feel that the distressing circumstances of his birth Leopold's heredity, instability on the father's side, lack of control on the mother's, may make conduct difficult for him. We have no idea, of course, what his mother will tell him concerning his origin. He has not yet had direct sex instruction, and almost any fact she might mention seems to us still unsuitable. We have explained to Leopold that his father is dead and his mother married in England for the second time we allowed him to understand. Why he is not with his mother, he has happily not asked. 
He appears to suspect nothing and exhibits no sign of brooding. We attempt to keep his childhood sunny and beautiful and do entreat that our work may not be undone. Sincerely, Marion Grant. Oh, those awful Americans. Why doesn't my mother hurry and get here? If I could only see the letter she wrote to Miss Fisher, the one that filled an empty envelope. My mother knows how to write about me. It would be a wonderful letter, too. It would go, My dear Miss Fisher, it is kind of you to have Leopold at your house for me to meet. I shall be coming at half past two on Thursday, so please have lunch over and be out of the way. Leopold and I shall go out, and you can come back as much as you want. We shall be very busy arranging things, as I'm taking Leopold home to England with me. He cannot go back to Spezia, as I mean to keep him. The other people there must get hold of some other child. I never did mean him to go back, but did not say so for fear of the fuss they would make. Hmm. So they can put that on their pipes and smoke it. I have come to the conclusion I cannot do without Leopold, because he is the only person I want. We have a great deal to say to each other, and I would... Leopold, what are you doing? Close that door. Don't shout. Did Miss Fisher send you to spy on me? No, she's much too busy with her mother. Madame Fisher is all upset. Naturally. She is ill. I told you that. Yes, but the reason why I had to leave the room was because when Madame Fisher began to talk about you, she got more ill. What did she say about me? Madame Fisher said that your father, whose name was Max, broke Miss Fisher's heart. Did she say anything about my mother? She said she was very beautiful. And she lived here once in this very house when she was a student in Paris. And your father must have been here, too, because Madame Fisher said you had his step. And Miss Fisher was engaged to marry your father. That was all in the past. It doesn't matter now, because my father's dead. Uh, my mother's coming for me at half past two, and that's almost now. Someone's at the door. I wonder who. I hear Miss Fisher coming down the stairs to answer it. It might be my mother. I knew you'd say that. Whatever it is, Miss Fisher's closed the door. And she's coming down the hall. This way. I knew it would be for us. Hello, Miss Fisher. What's the matter? Uh, Henrietta, darling. Uh, there's just been a telegram, an unfortunate message. Would you run away a minute, dear? Why should she? Is the message about me? Yes. I'm afraid it is, Leopold. Then let Henrietta stay. There are too many secrets about me. Very well. Then you may stay, Henrietta. Whatever you wish, my poor Leopold. I am not your Leopold. I belong to my mother. You must try not to excite yourself, Leopold, and, and try to be good and, and understand. There has been a change in the plans. What change? Your mother is not coming, Leopold. She cannot come today. Is she coming tomorrow? She did not say. Did she ever? Only that she cannot come. Why? Why? Why can't my mother come for me? Why has she never come for me? I came for her. Why didn't she come for me? Never. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? It has been observed that meetings that do not come off stay as they were projected. So the mother who didn't come to meet Leopold that afternoon remained his creature, able to speak the truth. He wanted to ask his mother, Why am I? What made me be? In the course of that meeting, whose scene remained inside Leopold, she would have told him what she had done without looking for motives. These he could supply, for he would understand. And when he asked, Why am I? What made me be? This, in effect, is what she would have to say. There is no telling when you really began, Leopold. Perhaps it was the day I was born. Or the day that Max first knew there was a me. One can't always say just exactly when anything begins. For fate is not an eagle. It creeps up on you like a rat. You might have begun that day in Ireland when I sat having tea with Aunt Violet at Cork and watching the ships steam up the tidal river from the Irish Sea. Aunt Violet is dead now. She was dying then. And she knew that the end was not far away. Her life was ending ten years ago, and mine was just beginning. I was 23 and engaged to marry Ray Forestier. He was a cousin's cousin, and our family approved. But the morning after our engagement appeared in the London Times, 
Ray was ordered off to the East on a government mission. And so the marriage was postponed. And I went off to Ireland to stay until Ray came back for me. There I found Aunt Violet, quietly making ready to leave the life that I was about to enter. I remember you as a child, Karen. You used to have so much character. I always felt you would have an interesting life. You do, I suppose, don't you? I suppose so, Aunt Violet. I admire the way you always seem to know what you want to do next. Well, I know what I want at the moment, but we're well, not always after that. I never had any character. I, I never did much of anything until other people suggested things. And when I did know what I wanted to do, it, it was too late. Oh, one sometimes wishes one had done more. But being you is enough for anybody. Perhaps. I think I should have been more selfish. I did so many things because people liked me to do them without my being sure why. It's so important to be sure. Oh, it's funny that you should mention that. It's what Ray said in his letter this morning. He wanted to be sure that I was sure about us. Are you, Karen? I thought I was until he asked me. It would be easier if Ray could be content with just me... But he always keeps wanting to know my feelings. He wants to know why and reasons. I, I do want to marry Ray, but well, I don't like to do anything that reasons have been found for. I like to do things I must do. Couldn't love be a reason? Oh, if you look close enough, there, there may be a reason for love. I think you're suffering from a long engagement, Karen. Perhaps. Uh, was there anything else in the mail? Just a letter from Paris... Naomi Fisher wants me to come back to London and meet her there. She's engaged to be married. Madame Fisher's daughter? Oh, she was so plain. Oh, Naomi has come into some money from an aunt. Well, the French gentlemen have always had a great respect for a dowry. Do you know the young man? His name is Max Ebhardt. When I lived there, he came often to see Madame Fisher. You may remember him. I can't recall. He wasn't Madame Fisher's age... But he was entirely her friend. We used to ignore Naomi. He's not the sort of person you'd care for at all. I cannot think what he wants Naomi for. Perhaps it is the money, then. Will you go back to London and meet them, Karen? Naomi has always been so kind to me. I should see them before the wedding. Is Madame Fisher with her in London? Oh, no, Max came instead. They're there to settle the inheritance. Then why don't you go to London, Karen? Not that I want you to leave, but, but you're getting too restless, perhaps, and, well, the trip might be just what you need. Dear Leopold, I guess maybe that was the beginning. When I got to London, I waited for Naomi in our drawing room and tried to imagine Naomi married to Max. Dear Naomi who loved me with that touch of devotion that can be on one side only, a thing you, you cannot return. And as I sat there, I, I practiced a smile of congratulations and worked myself to a point so that when she came in, I was able to say, Oh, my dear Naomi, how good it is to see you again. Congratulations. Thank you, Karen. But you are engaged yourself, are you not? You are happy, too. Oh, yes, of course. Ray and I are almost blissful. Except, of course, they sent him away. I know. How long will he be gone? Oh, a year, most certainly. Oh, but let's talk about you and Max. How is he? Oh, he is fine. You will like him now, Karen. Oh, I, I always liked him. But you were afraid of him. <laughs> I remember how just the thought of his coming to visit my mother's salon used to make you almost speechless. You were so shy of him. Yes. Oh, but that's the past, isn't it? Does he love you very much, Naomi? Yes. Naturally, I... I have asked myself many times, am I stealing him? I am in no way his type. I... I am not a femme du monde. You... You know how it is. Nobody looks at me. Oh, how often have I said, Max, what can I do for you? There seems to be nothing... But he says yes, that there is, and, and wishes me to believe him. 
Madame Fish is very pleased, I expect. No, oh, no. My mother opposed the match. Oh, but he and she are such friends. That alters nothing. She is not pleased with us. Does she interfere? Not any more now. She simply smiles and says nothing. She washes her hands of me. Well, where shall you live? Oh, where I am. I cannot leave my mother, and, and Max would not wish me to. And there is the house. We cannot just go away. No. No, I see. So you'll all go on just the same. Even though things are so different. We can only try. Good heavens, four o'clock. We are to meet Max for tea in Twickenham. <laughs> Whatever is Max doing in Twickenham? <laughs> the home of my aunt who left the money is there. Max has been there all day attending to details of the estate. There is a beautiful garden just now in bloom with spring flowers. I, I promised Max I would make a little tea for the three of us. You will come, won't you? Max made me promise to bring you. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, we can drive out in my car. Oh, I'm so glad. We are all such old acquaintances. On the drive out to Twickenham, Leopold, I thought of other afternoons when Max had come to visit Madame Fisher in the house in Paris. Max was the first man I had ever noticed. And when Naomi brought us together, I saw that he was as handsome as ever with his dark curly hair, soft dark skin, and his long childlike lashes that made his face appear flinching and sensitive. Mostly it was passive. Intellect, feeling, and force were written all over him. When I saw him in the garden, I wondered why Madame Fisher did not want him for a son-in-law. He greeted me cordially, and when Naomi went into the house to boil water for the tea, Max and I sat on the grass, not talking at first. Then he put his hand on mine. I suppose we should say something. Do we want to? Not really, but perhaps it would put us more at ease. Well, do you live indoors much? Yes, yes, I'm too busy. And games I never play, which is terrible in France. Ah, do you mean I shall get fat? Oh, no. I should think you were born thin. Oh, I did play tennis. Well? Oh, fairly well, but in Paris it was too expensive. And when I was a boy, I played in the south of France. Do you know people there? My mother's relatives live there. Are they Provençal? Oh, no, no. My uncle retired there to raise conditions. Ah, Karen, why do we talk like this? Oh, we can't just sit and look at each other. Oh, what do you and Madame Fisher talk about? Oh, we don't talk anymore. She finds me bad company after all these years. Why, Max? Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure, anyway. How long have you known Madame Fisher? I never knew. Oh, since I was 20. I was given a letter to her when I first came to Paris. That was 12 years ago. Until this year, I have not tried to separate what she made me from what I am. From the very first, she acted on me like uh, acid on a plate. Corrosive? Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, what her wit ate out is certainly gone, but more happened than that. As she saw me, so I became. Oh, her sex is all in her head, but she is not a woman for nothing. No, in my youth, she made me shoot up like a plant in enclosed air. She was completely agreeable. Our ages were complementary. Our brains became like senses, touching and drawing back. Well, then you acted on her, too. To an extent only. Madame Fisher was all ready for me when I was not ready for her. She had waited years for what I had not had time to miss. We met in her house, in all senses. Women I knew were as she made me see them. Any loves I enjoyed stayed inside her scope. She knew of them all. She mocked and she played upon my sensuality. She always had time to see me, and she did not turn upon me however angry she was. Until now. And she is angry about you and Naomi. She does not say so. I think Madame Fisher is in love with you, Max. I cannot think about her in that way. Do you think about me? I don't know. I knew you first as someone to leave alone. One of Madame Fisher's young girls that I might bow to, but not meet. That rule of the house stood all these years. Only now we have broken it. And already we have spoken too much. But you did not forget me. Even though there was nothing to remember, really. No. You have always been in my mind, Karen. Perhaps we didn't meet to talk. 
that is possible. If there had been something to say, we would have written to each other. There would have been letters. Oh, but there's nothing to say about wanting to be alone together. Ah, Karen. What would become of us? Is there anything worse than being apart always? Yes. Oh, yes. We should never tolerate each other if we were not in love. You would find my life mean, Karen. A good deal of what you are, I should not dare to touch. No, I am calculating and I like to see my way to my pleasures. To love you would be a leap in the dark, and you were not made to leap in the dark either. Why not? To leap is not only to leap, it is to hit the ground somewhere. Oh, you have a romantic idea, Karen. But we would be wretched married. You would rather marry Naomi? Yes. But why? Why are you marrying Ray Forestier? Oh, I may not after all. We're worlds apart. He won't be back for a year. Oh, I have all that time to make up my mind. But you and Naomi will marry in July. This is me. Ah, I am at home with Naomi. She reposes me and I need her. I'm not ashamed with her. There is nothing to be explained. And also I love her. I could not hurt her life. She would be my wife. And you and I expect so much the whole time. How do you know that? Ah, oh, how does one know anything? I haven't thought about you for five years. Are you telling me that I won't do? No, there is more to it than that. I cannot live in a love affair. I, I am not English. You know I have no humor to cushion myself with. I am nervous the whole time. I, I could not endure being always conscious of anyone. Now, Naomi is like furniture or the dark. I do not want adventure, Karen. And you are not capable of it. Now, please don't weep. You would kill me. But you don't know what you want. Why else am I here? Why did I come from Ireland? But we cannot be alone together in London. And I cannot stay in England another night because I must be to work by Monday by half past eight. Then we'll never be together. I cannot see how. But if you love me... I love you, but I must think. Oh, quickly. Naomi's coming with the water for the tea. Look... Karen, will you come next Saturday to Folkestone on the channel? Oh, no, no, I don't like Folkestone. I've been there. It's an awful place. But Hyde is nearby. Then will you meet me there? Oh, if you want me to, Max. I will come from France on the morning boat. I'll look for you. I am supposing that you know what you are doing. It will be too late when you ask yourself, what have I done? <laughs> From Hollywood, the NBC Theater is bringing you a dramatization of The House in Paris by Elizabeth Bowen. Our radio version of The House in Paris will continue from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. I go swimming every Monday and Wednesday and Friday. I feel so very good. Pick your favorite activity and your three favorite days and put them together. I play racquetball on Tuesday and Thursday and Friday just like I know I should. Participation says get active three days a week and you'll feel wonderful and build a stronger heart. I go hiking every Thursday and Saturday and Wednesday. Just do it, even on Sunday. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Elizabeth Bowen. The House in Paris is, for me, its author, to an extent, a mysterious book. In it, I can trace no part of my own experience. It seems to be almost perfectly clear of the me. For this reason, I rate it, in certain ways, more highly than other novels I have written. The central image of two children strangers to one another 
shut up for a day in a house in the heart of an unknown city, imposed itself on me like something out of dream. Who were these children? How had it happened that they arrived here? What was to be the signal for their release? In answering those queries, I found my story. When I was last in New York in 1933, I was brooding over the theme of the house in Paris, which I began to write immediately on my return to England. So, paradoxically, the house in Paris would always seem to me to be New York's child. The book was the fruit of the stimulus, the release, the excitement I had received here. Perhaps a newcomer to a city, hitherto a legend city, always feels childish. The little girl in my story, Henrietta, reacts with bewilderment to the impact of Paris. Could I have entered into her feelings if I had not just returned from an, another city equally new and significant to me? Children, as I believe Henry James said, are the ideal representatives of feeling, because in them feeling is still unmixed and pure. The child protagonists of the house in Paris are, to me, major characters in a sense that no adult could ever be. The technique problems that I encountered in the writing of the house in Paris were numerous. In so far as I stared through them, I did so under the influence of the theme itself. This book seemed set upon being written. Thank you, Miss Bowen. it rained the whole weekend and the sea air was washed on salt by the rain. Mm. On awakening in the middle of the night there was only the smell of tamarisks and wet grass. I thought how frightening luminous watches are. The eye of time never stops watching. I asked myself what have I done? I began to think of you, Leopold. And having done as I knew I must I thought of all the things to dread. The idea of you, Leopold, began to be present with me. And having done what I had done would no longer be something that was completed and already part of the past if there were to be you, Leopold. I should always see the hour of you. Like a wire, you would run through the past and keep it from falling apart and disappearing. You would be my enemy. Disaster. <laughs> You shouldn't sit by the window where there are storms. Oh, I, I thought you were asleep, Max. No, I've been thinking about Naomi. I have to tell her about us. But I don't see why. Because I must. How unfair to Naomi. Well, she belongs to your future. This finishes the past, Max. It, it doesn't touch the future. What's happened doesn't belong to now. It belongs to that year in Paris. Ah, but it could not have happened then. How much I, I wanted you just to even look at me then. But, but if I hadn't felt that this now was something that should have happened long ago, and that belonged to when it should have been, if I had not known that you loved Naomi and felt that she was the real now, I should never have come, Max. You should have told me this before, Karen. But I thought you knew. There was no question in my mind. How could you love anybody but Naomi? I was mad to think I could marry for love. For her love only. I see now that I cannot accept. What made you think you could then? Oh, how little you understand me, Karen. You do not know what it is to be suspect and know why. What it is to have no wall to put your back against. A, a fatigue I had not admitted even to myself made Naomi my pillow. And I victimized her. No, man. Yes. 
One, one afternoon, her mother left us alone and Naomi dropped her scissors. Seeing how gently she picked them up, I remembered that she was a woman. I said something and she started and pricked her finger. I saw from the pitying way she sucked the bead of blood from her finger how much she pitied me. And I saw at the same time that hers was the only pity I did not resent. I was overcome with the idea that here was someone who could make for me an unattackable safe place. I asked her to marry me. Oh, you have not regretted it? Not then. The force of the moment lasted. It twisted my senses until I found her bountiful because she was thin and beautiful in being ugly. Oh, must you say that? Desire for what she gave seemed to be desire of her. All my life I have been alone. In France, to have no family can be more humbling than poverty. The ambition for some other more advantageous marriage, which Madame Fisher credited me, fell away. And all this? All this was smashed by your meeting me in London? Yes. But you are not to blame. Madame Fisher encouraged me to go to London. She did not say so, but she knew of all the unspoken things that had gone between you and me in her house when you were there. And Naomi, did she know? Oh, she was not unaware. She wanted to be sure of me. That is why she wanted me to come to London. Naomi wanted to see us together before the marriage so that she could be sure. Is she sure? No. Since we returned from London, she has seen, though God knows how, that I love you. And she still wants to marry you? Yes. She desires to be desired. But her love of me is love of her own pain, and I will not live with a woman who lives with her own pain. Do you love me, Matt? Yes. Even though we have been two people darting across the sea to each other without having had time yet to be much of anything else? With no time to feel anything but compulsion? I love you, Karen. There is no doubt. But if I had known that you loved me, I would not have dared to come here. But now that you have, now that you know, would, would you marry me? Oh, you said in London that that was impossible. After that, I never let myself think about it. But it is all quite different now, Karen. Are you sure that this hasn't spoiled me? Not if you love me. Oh, I'm beginning to, Max. For the first time, I'm beginning really to love you. <laughs> It was two weeks later, Leopold, that Naomi's wire from Paris came to me in London. When it was brought, I thought it might be from Max, who had returned to Paris. It was not. But it was about him. Max was dead. At the end of her message, Naomi added that she would come to London as soon as possible, but that her arrival might be delayed by several days because of the inquest and the police investigations. And so, until she arrived on a Friday afternoon, I had to wait for Naomi to tell me what had happened. Karen, you have understood why I could not come before. Oh, of course. I had even thought I might have gone over to you. No, I... I think that was better not. It, it was better here. How much do you know about how it took place? I found the account and some papers. Then there was your letter. That's all I know. Do you want to know it all? As much as you care to tell. Then I will tell you. Max wrote telling me that he no longer loved me. I would not see him, and so he begged my mother to plead with me. And because he was beside himself, I agreed, and he came. We spoke of you and our love for you. He told me his difficulties had been preying on his mind, and and he spoke of a dread of being fatal to you. What did, did he tell you everything that there was to tell Naomi? Yes. I mean about how He going... told me everything. He said, what Karen and I are is outside life. We shall fail. We cannot live what we are. I said, I believe love to make any life possible. She does not know me, he said. Oh, he could not have been himself. I am sure he was not. My mother then came into the room and, 
and suggested that a long interview might upset me and, and she asked me to leave. Max looked at me like... like someone peering out through the bars of a death cell. My mother turned and said, So, Max, with Karen you have already secured your position. And he shouted at me, Go, Naomi. And then you left them alone? Yes, in the salon. Well, how long did they talk? I, I don't know. I was trembling. I, I could hear her voice shouting at him. And then I heard him go out. But the step was not like his own. I, I felt something was wrong. The, the whole house had gone strangely quiet. I, I rushed down the stairs. In the salon, my mother spoke to me. Go after him, she said. You fool, he's dying. Then I saw the blood splashed on the parquet where he had stood and in a trail to the door. I saw his penknife with a long blade open, fallen between where he had stood and my mother sat. My mother said, Naomi, he has cut his wrist to hurt me. I ran from her into the street, but there was no trace of blood there. He must have held his wrist and, and crossed into the alley where he fell down. And as no trace led us there, when we discovered him, it, it was too late which was what he wished. Your mother let him kill himself? He did it so quietly as they talked, she was not aware of what he had done. He's nervously fondling his penknife, and it was not until after it had happened did she notice that he had turned away and, and severed the artery in his wrist. But what right had she to reproach him? She said she did not. It was her commendation he could not bear. Whatever she said must have turned me to dust for him. You were out of her power, Naomi. He'd given you up. But they have killed him to see his love for me in her hands. I told Max once that she loved him. Her age can only have made that more terrible for her. And made her more relentless. Saw him love you. And then me. She had only her own power. Oh, but I was wrong about a loving Max. Or at least there was more to it than that. It was her power she loved. Oh, and that time it overreached itself. Oh, have I told you too much? I, I cannot tell where to stop and spare people's feelings. I. Oh, oh. forgive me, but. See, I, I'm going to have Max's child. Oh, I, I'm so sorry for you. Oh, but why? I want him to be born. Now his birth is what I want most. Why should Max leave nothing? Have you thought how he would live? We, we could live together someplace, I suppose. Somewhere where, where no one knew us would be exile. And if he's like Max and me, he would hate that. Hate exile, hate being nowhere. Hate being unexplained, hate having no place of his own. Oh, he'd hate me too, because of all that. Oh, he'd be better without me. In any place he could believe was his. Where would this be? Oh, Naomi with you. That is impossible because of my mother. Oh, must you live with your mother always? She doesn't love you. If she doesn't love me more, that is because she needs me. She does not care to need anyone as much as she needs me. And she and your child must not live in the same house. You must know, Miss Fisher. Tell me why my mother isn't coming for me. Whatever caused your mother to change her mind must have been unforeseen. You know... Even grown-up people cannot always do what they want most. Oh, children, children, that is my mother calling from upstairs. Now that your mother isn't coming, Leopold, you, you might as well go up and see my mother now. She has been asking to see you. I don't care particularly about seeing anybody now, least of all your mother. Come here, my darling, and, and let us neaten you up a little first. My mother has never seen you before, you know, Leopold. Well, well, Naomi. So this is Leopold. He's come all the way from Italy. I know that. 
Uh, how do you do, Leopold? How do you do, madame? Are you feeling better today? Uh, no. Oh, do feel better, mother? You must please let me decide, Naomi. I regret that you do not feel better, madame. Uh, at my age, one must expect to die soon. But Naomi takes such good care of her old mother that I am not allowed to die. Oh, there's somebody at the door. Why don't you see who it is, Naomi? If you think that's my mother, Madame Fisher, she's not coming for me today. Oh, indeed. Why don't you go anyway, Naomi? Uh, I think it would be better if I stayed here. I think it would be better if you went. The maid can answer. I insist. I would like to talk to Leopold alone. But I thought we agreed that that would be unwise. I have changed my mind. Do you understand, Naomi? Very well, but I will be back in a few minutes. Behave yourself, Leopold. Yes, Miss Fisher. Well, Leopold, we meet. Come over here by the bed where we can see each other better. This day has been hard for you, I suppose. Your mother not coming. We will meet some other time. We must not, of course, judge your mother. She always had courage, but could not always command what courage she had. People change their minds. Can I ask you questions? <laughs> if you wish. Uh, but you must not embarrass me. It is not easy for me to talk to you naturally for fear of perhaps inadvertently telling you something you do not know, and they mean you never to know. Who are they? Your good friends with whom you live in Italy, and my daughter, and your mother. Those people in Italy, do they know anything about me? That is the point. They cannot wish you to learn in this house more than they know themselves. You mean people who know me must not know that I was born? And people who knew that I was born must not know me? Exactly. Then no one except you here, and of course my mother, knows that I was born, do they? And your mother's husband, so I'm told, Mr. Forestier. Is my mother Mrs. Forestier? Mrs. Ray Forestier. Has my mother been Mrs. Ray Forestier long? Eight years. They were married the year after you were born. Forrest Jay may have encouraged your mother to see you. He has a romantic mind which I will never understand. Did you know my father, Madame Fisher? Fairly well. You do not know anything of him? I know one must have a father to have been born. The Americans in Italy said he was dead, though. That is true, I suppose. Perfectly. Then he must have known I was born. Never. He was, at the time he died, still more ignorant of you than it is generally wished you should be of him. Why did no one tell him about me? Because he was dead. Oh, what a shame you are still a child. I will never live to enjoy you as I'd like. Why? I'm dying too early. It's more a pity for me that I'm still a child. If I must go back to Italy now. You must not allow yourself to mind that. But I don't want to go back to Italy. Every Saturday, they weigh me like something to eat. Have they bought me or what? Why should I have to kiss them? And I wish every time I have to do that, that their faces would fall off. Like the outside of Bunyan's. Why was I given to them? It was Naomi's suggestion. So my mother let Naomi sell me to the Americans? Your mother was very ill. She could not be consulted. But didn't my mother care when this thing was done to me? Your mother was a long time in getting well. It is possible that the death of Mr. Forrest Jay's child may have closed her heart against you. Someone's at the door. Well, open it. If it's Naomi, tell her to go away. It's Henrietta. 
How do you do, Madame Fisher? I have a message for Leopold. He is to come downstairs at once. Is that all? Tell my daughter that Leopold and I are having a conversation. She said that if you said that, I should tell you that there is a visitor for Leopold. Is it my mother? A man. American? English, I do believe. We weren't introduced. Miss Fisher kept the salon door closed until she looked out and asked me to come here and get you. I was sitting on the stairs. Where is the man now? In the salon, talking with Miss Fisher. I don't know what they were talking about because they kept the door closed. I'm sure you know what you're doing, Ray, but, but don't you think you're forcing Karen's hand? In what respect, Naomi? By coming here alone after she changed her mind about seeing Leopold. I don't believe she changed her mind. That's why I don't believe I'm changing it for her at all. She's been waiting to see Leopold for years. Then why isn't she here now? Oh, I think it was just too much for her. She wasn't quite up to it. So I've come. But what did she say when you told her that you were coming to take Leopold and bring him back to her? I didn't tell her. But she must have known when I left the hotel that I was going out to fetch him. But if Karen was too upset to come here herself and and just visit with him, how will she feel when you come back bringing Leopold with you? I have it. Hello? Naomi? Karen, where are you? In the Hotel Versailles. I'm sorry I couldn't come, Naomi. You got my message? Yes. I do hope you understand my not explaining why I haven't come, that is. But I will. I'll write to you. Uh, Ray isn't there, is he? Yes, Karen, he oh, is. Well, put Ray on, will you? Uh, he's right here. Just a moment. It's Karen for you, Ray. I was afraid of this. Naomi, can you get Leopold's clothes ready? Of course, right away. I'll get them now. Hello, Karen. Ray? Ray, I just heard what you said to Naomi. Oh, surely you don't mean you're bringing him. If he wants to come, he may not want to. But if he does... Then I'll bring him. Must you really do this thing? You talk as if I were doing something to you. He's only a little boy. He's more than that. He's the enemy. Our own child would have lived if you'd wanted him. But you wanted your own ideas more. All you wanted was Leopold. Why must you feed your complicated emotion on what happened to me? Why can't you be a plain man? Was Max a plain man? I have no memory. You remember everything. I only remember you're coming back, Karen. No, what you remember is taking me back. Kissing me with that unborn child still with me. That was part of your complicated emotion. Well, what do you want me to do, hate the child? No, I, I still want to be with you. Alone and not remembering. That's why you must not bring Leopold here. We can never be alone, Karen, as long as there is a Leopold anywhere and you keep dreading him. If he were with us, he'd be simply a child, either in or out of the room. While he's someplace else, he's everywhere and always between us. Oh, let me worry about that. It isn't right for you to want him as much as you do. But I love you, Karen. Would you want Leopold more if I wanted him less? Is that it? I don't know. I don't know. Why haven't you forgiven me? But I have. I have. What have I said? You said nothing. That's just it. Forgiveness should be an act. With you, it's some kind of state. You forgive me for wanting Max while there's my not wanting Leopold not to forgive me for. Oh, but if I gave in to wanting Leopold, you would bring Max back and, and refuse to forgive me for him. Oh, Ray, you don't want to forgive. Karen. 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 Come in. Hello, Naomi. Ray, do you want to see Leopold? Still? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You better send a telegram to Spezia this afternoon telling them something. Oh, what shall I say? Oh, something like, Leopold wishes remain Paris a few days longer. Full explanation follows. We, or I, will follow that with a letter. Give me a pencil. I'll scribble some sort of a wire for you. Leopold is waiting outside. He's very anxious to see you. Well, I'm sure he can wait a moment or two longer, as long as he isn't into mischief. Oh, no, no. He and Henrietta sitting out on the stairs, talking. Heavens, this is exciting, Leopold. Not to me. I knew my mother would send somebody for me. My mother wants me very much. I'm sure she must. 
She probably couldn't come because she had a cold or something. She's probably out buying presents for me. A bicycle, I hope. They wouldn't let me have a bicycle in Spezia. Don't you miss those people in Italy? Why should I? I didn't belong to them. Miss Fisher gave me away to them like I was a dog or something. But no one's really told you yet that you weren't going back to Italy. I won't. Just you wait and see. He wouldn't have come here not to take me back. But what if you don't like the man? Mr. Forrestier is married to my mother, isn't he? Yes, and that's what made me ask. If he's married to your mother, that would make him your stepfather. Uh, I suppose it would. But lots of people have stepfathers. I'm sure I'll like him. Well, I hope you will like him. But I always think of David Copperfield and that dreadful Mr. Murdstone. I've got... You have been listening to The House in Paris an NBC theater production of the novel by Elizabeth Bowen. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.